with us for the next hour. It was 1977. He had had to resign the presidency of the United States three years or in disgrace, never avoiding being impeached and thrust, frankly, to make a little money. Uh, so he agreed for a large fee to sound for a series of TV interviews in which he basically wanted to talk about anything other than Watergate. But he also wanted to defend himself on Watergate. He wanted to try to shape his legacy, to try to be seen as something other than just a disgraced crook who had to resign as president. Um, that effort, that effort to rehabilitate his image, to defend himself on Watergate, led Rick Nixon to this iconic moment in the American Nazi. Well, when the president does it, that means that it is not illegal. Richard Nixon was trying to rehabilitate his image there. That did not help. If the president does it, by definition, it's not illegal? The president of the United States is above the law just by virtue of being president? Richard Nixon is still and will forever be viewed as a crook and a disgrace to the presidency, not only because of the crimes committed by the administration, but because of that outrageous assertion in his post-presidency interview uh, with David Frost. For any one thing as a country, we are not a kingdom. We are, we are a place where nobody is above the law, where no person is greater than the institution, even if they are the president. That is fundamental to who we are as a country and why we exist as a country. Less than 10 years after that Nixon interview, we had a new president who was the aesthetic opposite of him. Where Nixon was shifted and sweaty and paranoid, Reagan was sunny and confident. He was a very good commander as president, and he knew. But you know, Reagan wrote over and over his diary as president that frustrated him. He wrote one thing that he felt exception to his ab to persuade American people by virtue powers of communication. Ronald Reagan, high approval ratings, he had been able to get his on tax policy, on social issues, and all sorts of things related to the Cold War and the military. But you know, he really, really wanted the U.S. to get involved militarily in Central America. And despite all of his power, he could persuade the country to do he lamented his diary, quote, vacations on Nicaragua have been a failure. Says so pollster, he said, quote, Dick Wynn's poll figures are interesting and hold well, except for the Nicaragua issue. He could not get the public to go with him on Central America. He could not get the cars to go along with him on Central America. This was the thing he could not persuade anybody to go along with him about. And it wasn't for lack of trying. He talked about it all the time. He kept trying to persuade people, so everybody knew that he wanted to do it. But the answer was a really resounding no. From Congress, the answer was no with an exclamation point. Congress knew what Ronald Reagan wanted to do in terms of us getting militarily in. Congress responded by the law saying, we know you want to do this. You cannot do this. You cannot do it with the military. You cannot do it with the CIA. You cannot do it with any other agency. We know you want to do it. You cannot do it. It is illegal. No. N-O. No. And Ronald went ahead and did it anyway. And since it was legal, and he couldn't get the money from Congress to do it, in order to fund this illegal thing he wanted to do, he sold weapons to Iran. Seriously. And yeah, this was after the hostage crisis. This was at a time when it was very clearly illegal to sell weapons to Iran. Illegal, very obviously. It's not like we weren't paying attention to Iran at the time, or there was some loophole or something. It was blatantly, flagrantly illegal. Where Reagan got the money from, and also what he did with the money, illegal. He broke the law overtly and on purpose. And these were huge, international, world-changing crimes. This was not putting a bug in office of the Democratic Party chairman's us, right? This was not uh, stealing somebody's psychiatric records like Watergate was, right? This missiles to Iran that really did get delivered in order to fund the breaking of another law in Central America. And when Reagan got caught, as he inevitably had to, the Reagan administration's justification for all this was essentially just an update of what Nixon had said about Watergate. And Nixon, Nixon had said, well, remember what he said? Well, when the president does it, means that it is not illegal. Okay, the Reagan update on that was essentially, if the president does it and it's about national security, means it's not illegal. Even though Reagan had both sides of hyphen in this scale, both the Iran side and the Con side, even though he had done both sides secretly, hoping no one would find out, the Reagan administration, after the fact justification for what he had done and why he had done it, was under Reagan's commander-in-chief powers as president, it was perfectly legal for him to do anything he wanted to do, no matter what the laws were of the United States, because he was president. It's crazy, right? I mean, disaster. There were high-level indictments, administration officials went to jail. Amazingly, Reagan himself avoided impeachment, but it came time for Congress to investigate this scandal. It was pretty much a slam dunk. They condemned not just what Reagan had done, but the outrageousness of that defense, the idea that he could get away with being any law just because he was president. 
It was not a call. It was, it was not a particularly pardon verdict by Congress when Congress invested this scandal. But there was one dissent. There was a minority report. The dissent to Congress's findings was filed by one Congress who said that actually he agreed with the administration on this. He agreed that if the president does it and it is national security, then by definition it isn't. He agreed that to a commander in chief, laws mean nothing. A president can do whatever he wants when it comes to national security. That was the little notice, pretty much totally overlooked minority report in the Iran-Contra investigation. That report was commissioned by a backbench, almost totally anonymous Wyoming congressman whose name was Dick Cheney. And Dick Cheney, of course, went on to become Dick Cheney. <laughs> but his whole history in politics, his whole rise to power is filled with amazing stuff like this. I mean, when, when he was in Congress, Dick Cheney voted against asking the African government to let Nelson Mandela out of prison. He voted against a federal holiday to recognize Martin Luther King Jr. When, when Dick Cheney went to department, he let a little few million dollar contract for a study to see if it would be possible for a private company to handle all logistics for a U.S. military operation abroad. So not just a, a fuel contract here and a maintenance contract there like we'd done before, but one overarching wheatheart guaranteed profit deal to all of the logistics, handle it all, buildings, feeding the troops, doing laundry, doing anything else the U.S. military to do for itself, but doing it for profit instead. Dick Cheney paid a company study whether or not that could be done. It was a company we now call Halliburton. Halliburton looked into this prospect and they decided that yes, it could be done. But they also found that there was really only one company that could do it themselves. <laughs> and so lo and behold, they got that giant new kind of contract. And thus a whole new business model was born, which very quickly became Leviathan. And which the US government says sent at least $30 billion up in smoke during the Iraq and Afghanistan wars alone. After leaving the Defense Department, Dick Cheney obviously went to go become CEO of Halliburton. <laughs> and that is where he was working when George W. Bush, then candidate George W. Bush, asked Cheney to look into would be the best trim as his vice president mate. Like him, Dick Cheney got study on, surveyed the scene, looked at all the options, and indeed, there was a great candidate to be George W. Vice President, only one. And he picked himself. That is how we ended up. Vice President, somebody giving him a hard Halliburton thing on the floor by telling state senator on the floor of the United States Senate, go bleep yourself, senator. Reflecting back on his vice presidency after leaving office, Mr. Cheney looked back on the go bleep yourself moment fondly. The best thing I ever did. <laughs> but, oh, Cheney, how do you narrow it down when you've done so much? Mr. Cheney, you are the most astonishing figure in American politics. We expect some people to be very, very radical in American politics. We have a wide-ranging, wide-open, unconstrained political system. We expect them to be really radical. We also expect some people to unexpectedly gain power in politics. But there is nobody who approaches your combination of maximum power and maximum radicalism. It is astonishing that somebody as radical as you got to be as powerful as you did in our country. If I stand fired up about this, I am. I am fascinated by you. You know that book I wrote there, Drift, is dedicated to Dick Cheney in the hopes that he will let me interview him about these things someday. I have a lot to ask him. But now it's politics. We are still trying to figure what it does to our as a country, and specifically what it does to the Republican Party. To have had somebody that radical in the vice presidency for eight years, how does that affect the party in an ongoing way, particularly as the party is still sort of trying to find itself? I mean, George W. Bush left office, his approval rating was 22%, but Dick Cheney's was 13%. Herpes was more popular than Dick Cheney when he left office. America Wolf from the book, Bush, by, oh my God, what booking? Okay. Is the concentrated lit left in the bar. He is everything America most hates and most hate about Republican radicalism in his years. It all him. Just his history alone is the history of what the administration will be for if the history of the Bush administration is written by un- He's the guy who said, deficits don't matter, and he meant it. He's the end from the administration who the CIA to personally comb through the intel to cherry pick be used to jar against Iraq, justified. The gymnastic, acrobatic, and ultimately pitiful efforts to try to leave was mostly done through Cheney's office. He had the oil companies come to the White House to secretly write the administration's energy policy, and then he fought to keep secret the fact that they had ever been there. But if you like the war in Iraq, that was not only brought to you courtesy of the Cheney family's recipe for cooking, and, but here's exactly how much content he had for your views on the subject. Tons of Americans say it's not worth fighting. So? So. It is amazing that Cheney ever held high office in this country. 
The Bush administration in which he served is so deeply unpopular that the former president's endorsement of the current Republican nominee was delivered from inside the closing doors of an elevator, and the former president has not said anything about it since. Of course, sources close to the Mitt Romney campaign, there are no plans to do any campaign events whatsoever with George W. Bush. They did not even put out a press release noting the endorsement of the former president of the United States. Now, it is not surprising the Republican Party would not be all that enthused about the legacy of George W. Bush. But what do you make of the fact that they are all on board with the legacy of Dick Cheney? Around these campaign, sending out emails announcing that former Vice President Dick Cheney will be hosting a joint fundraiser for the Massachusetts governor at his home in Wyoming. That has not been written. Uh, it, it has now been a couple of days since it was announced that Dick Cheney would be hosting a fundraiser for Mitt Romney this summer, a fundraiser at which Mitt Romney will be president, uh, will be present. That, that, that announcement was made two days ago, so it has now been long enough that we are pretty sure it was not a joke, it was not a misprint, nobody has retracted it. That is really happening. And then today, former Bush administration Secretary of State Colin Powell, former chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, shined a huge spotlight on this issue by expressing his own incredulity at the number of Bush-Cheney holdovers have turned up on the Romney foreign policy team. Are you concerned with uh, the foreign policy measures that Mitt Romney himself with? We need to have yet another Republican candidate <laughs> who is sort of top when it comes to neoconservative surrounding. I've noticed that. I don't know who all of his advisors are, but I've seen some of the names, and some of them are, are quite far to the right, and sometimes they, I think, uh, might be in a position to make judgments or recommendations to the uh, candidate that uh, should get a second thought. General Powell yesterday show expressed much same sentiment, advising that people should not choose between President Obama and Romney as individuals when they go to vote this number, but they should also get, quote, who they have coming with them. 17 of Romney's 24 foreign policy advisors are Bush Cheney guys. Even as Mr. Romney is shunning the endorsement and any joint appearances with a former president of the United States, George W. Bush, he is proudly publicizing and doing fundraisers with Dick Cheney. We are still in the process of figuring out who the Republican Party is after Bush and Cheney. They did not become the party of McCain when John May became their nominee in 2008. They did not become the party of Sarah Palin. We still do not exactly know who they're going to be. They're still in the process of figuring it out. And with George W. Bush, they still don't really seem to know what they do with him. But who could have predicted? Who predicted that the guy they would decide are definitely still down with, and they don't want at the forefront of their party, the one guy they still want fly or flag, is Mr. Go Bleak Yourself, Senator. I defy you to prove to me that anybody saw this coming. Last weekend, I C-SPAN, and I saw President Dick Cheney, and he was questions about all issues, following 9-11, affairs and various in the world, and I listened to him speak, say, will you agree with them or do them? This is a Mr. and judgment, and he's president of the United States. What kind of person, person of wisdom, judgment. Four more years. New York Magazine writer-at-large Frank Rich joins us next.